This is Down the Owl Wrestling Podcast, where we only make one promise. We will always reach for that. That's really. With Robbie Mack and Kevin Larme. Here's Kevin Larme. And welcome to a brand new edition of Down the Owl Wrestling Podcast. Rob, today we had the chance to talk to an author about a great pioneer of some sort in the wrestling business. A pioneer and a guy who... You might not, you, it's kind of just to show, you know, pardon the puns as we talked to an author, but you can't judge a book by its cover because you see this guy, you think he's some sort of maniac, but he's really just an American guy who's, who's, who sticks, who speaks with a Southern accent, who played a great job at, who did, really did a great job of the character he was given. He was a big teddy bear, in other words. It's fine. I would say so, but I don't know if I'd want to snuggle up with this teddy bear. <laughs> yeah, but that's for totally different reasons. Yeah, we had Kenny Casanova on the show today, the uh, the ghost author with Kamala of James L. Harris, of Kamala Speaks, autobiography, biography of uh, the legend of Uganda wrestling. He was a great interview, almost 25 minutes. We had a chance to talk about Kamala's history, his story, his ups, his downs. His uh, He was the first to wear makeup and face paint. Can you believe that, Rob? Yeah, I was a little surprised. I had no idea. He was the first American wrestler to wear face paint. And he, and you know, well, we won't spoil the surprise, but he actually inspired two other wrestlers. I just thought, Rob, if it wasn't for him, yeah, WrestleMania 31 would really suck. It sure would. And we... We might not have a member of the Hall of Fame, so it's kind of cool to hear that because I had no idea about that. And, and, and it was kind of cool to hear how that one of those people were very, very nice to Kamala and really took care of him. Absolutely. So without further ado, here's Kenny Casanova, author of Kamala Speaks. And welcome back to Down the Hour Wrestling Podcast. It's with great pleasure that we welcome to the show today Kenny Casanova, a ghostwriter, writer with uh, Kamala, uh, James Harris, on Kamala Speaks, a book that came out in last October about the life story and the wrestling story of James Kamala Harris. First of all, Kenny, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. First of all, let's explain to our listener the, the, how the idea of the book with Kamala came about and how the process was of recording uh, those interviews that you did that inspired the book. Well, it's funny because uh, James, uh, for people... He's a survivor now of a uh, double amputee. Uh, can you hear me okay? I yep. kind of noise. No worries. Okay. Uh, yes, and... Uh, my mother also was diabetic, and I had heard that uh, he was having the same type of issues. Uh, so I pretty much gave him a call and told him, hey, you know, um, I know times are rough right now, but if maybe we could get a book together, it would help you um, offset your medical costs, just your story alone, I think. You know, the problem, telling the, pr- telling the story about the problem may help solve some of the problem. And uh worked with him for about... Uh, seven, eight months, interviews, interviewing his peers, and um, we put together his book, and it's doing pretty well right now. If you're looking at your, probably like every one of us, a wrestling fan, what inspired you in the Kamala story? What type, what part of the story really grabbed you? Because we all know you had that run in WWE, but that, that's not really the, the, the essence of the book. It's more the unknown about Kamala. So, so what really sparked you in his story? You know, from hearing the interviews, uh, the stuff that I enjoyed putting together and producing with him, uh, the chapters, uh, like you said, wasn't really the wrestling. It was uh, some of his growing up as a um, a black youth in Mississippi during the Civil Rights Movement and uh, pushed 1950 uh, to 1970 in there. Um, he grew up uh, in a small place outside of Memphis, uh, Coldwater, and Senatobia. And, um, man, he had a bunch of stories about running into problems with the law where uh, his family, family was poor and he wasn't able to um, uh, appetite. He, he couldn't fulfill his big appetite. He liked to eat a lot. So he would steal food. 
And uh, eventually that led to him being run out of town by uh, the sheriff. And he had to leave his high school in uh, middle eighth, ninth grade or so, went to Florida and uh, started farming as a, as a young teenager in, in, uh, in Florida. So, I mean, there's a lot of survival. The story is very layered uh, in that he had issues with, uh, certainly issues with racism. Uh, you know, down in Mississippi, they were bucking the idea of uh, uh, civil rights and, and, and all, um, more so during that time than anyone else. And then also, you know, later on in life, his uh, diabetic issues. And then along the way, uh, problems with wrestling. Um, he's not a super well-educated guy, so a lot of times promoters took advantage of him. Uh, so it's a constant struggle uh, for survival in the game. Kenny, for me, I'm in my early 30s, so my memories of Kamala were more of the mid mid-early 90s Kamala when he feuded with The Undertaker and did the casket match stuff. For you, just kind of as a as like a, maybe as like a fan question, what is your earliest memories of Kamala, and when did you see him, and you and kind of what drew you to his character, or what drew you to Kamala as as a man? You see, I'm a little older, so I'm uh, I'm in my early forties, and uh, I remember seeing him on the trailers for Coliseum Home Video, which was okay. the early WWE uh, videos, um, and he was uh, he was fighting Andre the Giant to steal cage. Mm-hmm. And um, also, I was a big world-class guy. I liked to watch the Von Erich, and he had showed up there a number of times as well. So I remembered a lot of those appearances. Now, I didn't get Memphis wrestling, and that's where he uh, really, you know, um, started the, the Kim the Cow with Jerry the King Lawler and Jerry Lawler um, kind of uh, feeding the pieces to the puzzle. Um, but, yeah, I, I would say probably the Andre the Giant clips of, uh, of seeing him fight in the steel cage and... Um, uh, just like all the other kids back then, uh, you know, most most of the times if you went and saw a wrestling show live, you would run up. And you'd want to still kind of see if you could slap the, uh, you know, the villain five or, like, pat him on the shoulder or, or what have you. Um, he was the one wrestler that if you saw him live, that wasn't the case. The kids would run the other way, and they wanted nothing to do with him. And I, I think that he, he was so believable in his character um, and so skilled at what he did that I'm not sure anybody else would um, would have done the role uh, justice. And uh, he was scary, um, a scary character to me, too. When I watched him on TV, I remember thinking to myself, this isn't right. Why did they let him bring a spear to the ring? Why can't he bring a mask to the ring? But, you know, this guy, he, he looks like he wants to eat somebody. He's slapping his stomach. And, you know, I, I remember getting angry about the character. So he was doing his job right. You said, Kenny, you hit the nail on the head when you said Kamala was believable because, yeah, I legit, when I found out that Kamala wasn't from, when he wasn't actually the Uganda giant, he was a guy from Mississippi, I was shocked. Like, <laughs> are you kidding me? This, you know, this guy's American? That's that's awesome. No, but he, uh, James played the, the character perfectly, and I don't think, and I think you said it perfectly, like, you really couldn't have had a better guy play it. Kenny... Not a lot of people might know this, but you've, you're kind of like a jack of all trades. You've wrestled, you've color commentated, you've managed countless of talents. You run your own DJ business. So my two questions are, when do you get time to sleep? And my second question is, how did you get started in the wrestling business? Okay, uh, questions. All my buddies all say the same thing. When do you have time to sleep? But honestly, I'm probably a bit of a workaholic. Um, and it, it may have cost me a couple of um, But... Uh, I guess if you really want to do something and do it right, sometimes it takes the extra, you know, hours. And uh, to get this book done and, and be a success for James, it's been a full-time job. I'm really not trying to make any money off of it for myself. Um, we're throwing him all the money we can from it. Uh, and, I, you know, every day, like, I just came back to the post office now uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, mailing, mailing books out. Um, so, yes, yeah, it's... Uh, I, I got my hand in a lot of things. I guess I like to be creative. I think that's probably one of my biggest traits. And, and in order to be creative, well, that yeah, takes time. Uh, your other question was, what was it, the second part of the question? Oh, how did you get started in wrestling? Like, what, oh, okay. what, how did, where did you start? Uh, uh, what happened was, is I was running a comic book store in, what, in a now defunct mall, one of those ghost kind of malls. It's, not, it's all gone now here. It's Lake Street Circle Mall, also a country country mall in upstate New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, areas, and 
in the comic book store, we had a guy who wanted to go to wrestling school. There wasn't one in the area. Now that's the independent promotion uh, scene is pretty big. There's a lot of little indies and everything. But back then, there was nothing. And we had to, we had to travel four hours uh, every weekend. Me and this guy named Thorne, he also went by the name Sweet Pete Waters. We did a couple of things. He traveled around a little bit, uh, did some jobs at Winners of Honor uh, early on. Also traveled with another guy named uh, Dave Deshaun, who was known as, as Danger, um, and a few others. But we went to this place called Skull Crusher's Gym in Elmira. And uh, one of the people that was in the same class as us, which was the first class, was H.P. Loke, mm-hmm. who some people may remember. Um, he was he did a ref gimmick in ECW where he also ref, and he was in Ring of Honor. He actually booked for Ring of Honor for a while, so... He was, a, he was a bit of a name. He he actually recorded the music, uh, the new Kamala theme that mm-hmm. we used for the trailers and everything. Um, super nice guy. So, you know, we did a, a bunch of stuff down there in Elmira. I learned um, with a, a bunch of different wrestlers kind of trained us. The, uh, the guy who was running it was actually a wrestling promoter, and he would bring in different trainers to kind of give us, you know, um, the basics and all. Some of those were T.C. Reynolds and uh, Preston Steele, who some people may know from WCW. A more known name was uh, uh, Tom Brandy, South and Cedar. Um, yep. I did a ton of stuff with him early on, so you might know him. Yep. Uh, they also brought in people like Bam Bam Bigelow and, uh, and even the great Virgil himself. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we learned with a, a bunch of those guys, and uh, I learned early on that I could wrestle. That was okay. Uh, but at at five eleven, just about six foot, I wasn't as big as what was needed then. Um, now, the independent scene is you know a lot. It's a lot smaller, a lot more aerial, um, a lot more high flying. But I was very creative, so it, I started to become a jack of all trades. I wrote the programs. I uh, was a ring announcer. I was uh, a manager most of the time, and uh, I liked to to sing wrestlers to the ring with a cheap karaoke gimmick, like a lounge wizard type of thing. Uh, so that's kind of the background that I came from, uh, all of that uh, creative behind-the-scenes stuff, as well as some of the uh, extra stuff needed with the talent. Okay. If we go back to the early beginnings of the Kamala, in quotes, story, when he goes to Memphis at the beginning and uh, Jerry Lawler looks at him and slaps a moon and a star on his belly and decides to put him out there, <laughs> Just how influential was Jerry Lawler in James Harris' career? Uh, very, and also not very. It's a, it's a, it's a two-sided sword. Uh, what happened was is uh, James Harris wasn't getting booked as he went by Sugar Bear, uh, James Harris, uh, Jim Harris, Ugly Bear. He had a bunch of different names um, in the Mississippi independent area, which I... Um, which was run by the Culkins uh, in that territory. They weren't in NWA, but they did some stuff um, with uh, NWA and AWAs, too. Um, they kind of held their own there, but they, they had some talent at great uh, agreements. Um, eventually, he wasn't getting booked a whole lot, and he moved to Mexico, and he started looking for work there. And then he picked up um, a two-year gig in England, and there was a guy there named Quick Kick Lee that um, accidentally broke his foot in a match. And James decided to come back to America. Now, when he came back, um, he still had a cast on his foot. He was looking to get some tights and see if he could set up some kind of new gimmick. And he had thought about doing a uh, tribal-like gimmick. James uh, Harris had traveled around. Uh, he eventually took a gig, a two-year gig, over in England. And from there... Uh, a guy named Quick Kick Lee was doing a Bruce Lee type gimmick, broke his foot accidentally, which actually turned out to be a blessing. Now, when he came back to the States, um, he had uh, been uh, looking for a new gimmick to do, and some different people contacted him and told him, hey, you should try this and you should try that. I think the great Mephisto um, from, uh, uh, from the Mississippi Territories that he had worked with some. Um, he had told him that you definitely should go and, uh, and do an African type game because while he was in England, he, he started, um, taking some different, 
uh, international tours. And one place he went to was Africa. And he came up with the idea to paint his face when he went back to England and started to act like a little bit in the early stages of what would be Kamala. But he didn't really have the whole gimmick figured out. And broke his foot, came back to America, was looking to kind of get a new gimmick. And there was a guy named... Uh, He's uh, a dream machine, dream machine Graham. Uh, and he went to find him during a Memphis show, and Jerry the Lawler took a look at him and was like, oh, I got an idea for you. I want you to go home right now and not talk to anybody. So Kamal was like, all right. You know, and he said, what's, what's the deal with the cast, though? He's like, oh, the ca- cast is going to come off in a couple of days. But Kamal was supposed to wear that, like, another, like, months or something. He wasn't really supposed to be taking it off, but he was excited about maybe getting to work for Memphis. Now, Memphis at the time, they had just did a big run with Andy Kaufman and Jerry the King Lawler, which was famous. So the next big uh, villain was going to be the opposite of Andy Kaufman, who was a little skinny comedian. It was going to be a big monster. They didn't have any big guys in Memphis at the time. They were all kind of medium built. So uh, Jerry the King Lawler brought him down to Jerry Jarrett's farm out back in the woods. Uh, they took a uh, tribal mask off of Jerry Jarrett's wall, which became a big part of Kamala's character. They gave him a big spear. They had some earrings they bought at a yard sale and some bracelets that they picked up at the Five and Dime. And uh, they painted him up looking like a comic book character that uh, Jared King Lawler saw from Frank Frazetta, who uh, was an artist for Conan uh, the Barbarian, a Marvel comic. And uh, from there, that's how uh, the Kamala character was born so it was a little bit of Kamala and a little bit of the Jerry King Lawler um, and Jerry Jarrett approach Uh, but at the same time Kamala just hates the idea that he didn't come up with the whole look himself as well and that's why later on if you've looked in old books you might see Kamala spelled K-I-M-A-L-A Kamala wanted something out of it James Harris wanted his stamp on the gimmick so he changed it to K-A so all these spellings of K-A, M-A-L-A, um, were a direct result of James wanting his own personal stamp on, on the gimmick after he left Memphis. Um, and just one other side note, uh, James Harris is the first American to wear face paint as part of the character, as part of the gimmick. Oh, wow. Regular deal. The, only, the only person that did it before him was Michael Hayes. And Michael Hayes didn't really paint his face as a regular deal. He just kind of did it here and there, almost like an accessory or almost like a uh, more like you know, an extra added thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, there, wa- there was Kabuki, who did it before Kamala a bit um, in Japan. In Japan yeah. And that's kind of where... Uh, uh, there was another guy, too. There was another guy that actually came over to America, and I'm, I, his name escapes me at the moment. Um, Gary Hart saw that guy, copied him with Kabuki. And, um, but then James started doing it all the time. And he was the only guy that really made it part of his face, part of his look. And when they, when he was back in mid South with, uh, cowboy Bill Watts, we credit him being the best motors ever with earning him the most amount of money, even above and beyond Vince McMahon. Uh, two guys came up to James and they said, uh, how, you know, how do you paint your face like that? Can you show us? We want to do something like that. And those two guys were called the Blade Runners. <laughs> and then years later, that was Sting painting his face in Ultimate Warrior. So Kamala was the one that showed him how to paint the face, what to use, and how to do it, you know, and make it look good. Um, awesome. And they made a lot of money off of that. And it, and it paid off for him, too, because later on, when Kamala wasn't making a whole lot of money, uh, WWE, maybe, you know, some people would argue, He's taken advantage of a little bit. He, he wasn't very good at negotiating, not too good with numbers. Um, uh, the Ultimate Warrior came up to him and said, hey, man, whenever you're on a show with me, I want you to jump in the limo with me. We'll, ju- we'll just, uh, I don't want to say break kayfabe, but we'll just like, uh, you know, get you in there at a different time, move the limo and get me in there. That way you don't have to drive and pay for any travel. And if you're ever on an airplane, I'm buying you the ticket. And if you're ever in the same hotel, I'm buying you the room. Uh, because I'm making plenty of money, man. So Ultimate Warrior, who a lot of people didn't like working with, and even James said his matches weren't that great. They were like, uh, James says, you know, I would work for him in 30 seconds. It would be done right after that. You know, um, 
But uh, the warrior went above and beyond to try to help him out when he knew that James wasn't making a whole lot of money. So I thought that was a pretty cool story. And that was the kind of pay him back, probably for the face paint help in the uh, Mid-South days. That's that's good. That kind kind of stuff is good to hear, Kenny. My question is, and kind of uh, like if the, the listeners would probably want to know too. You kind of touched upon it at the beginning about uh, Kamala's, you know, the the diabetes and unfortunately losing both of his legs. Sure. How is how is Kamala doing? And you know, how is yeah, just basically how's he doing and how's he holding up? He's doing a bit better. Uh, we had a little scare right a little bit before the last proof was going into the book when we uh, set up Kickstarter. Uh, the book had been written since July or something, but um, believe it or not, when you're in self-publishing, which was the best answer for Kamala because he get to keep the most of the money self-publishing mm-hmm. over uh, publishers and all. Um, he keeps all of it. There's no middleman. Uh, when you're in the self-publishing to get, get it edited and get it uh, laid out and to get everything done, it takes a number of months. So we probably finished, we probably wrapped it up in, in July or so, or, you know, writing the book, but, um, took a while. We were about set to, to release it and give it, give the rewards first out on um, the first print, the book to everybody, um, that had donated to the Kickstarter to make the book happen for him. as a fundraiser. Mm-hmm. Um, James got real sick in November, just before we could print it. And he uh, he had a real bad stomach infection, uh, something called like periodontitis or totus or something like that. Is that the same um, thing Brock Lesnar had? Yeah, that was the verticalitis. Oh, okay. I just the vitus. Okay. Yeah, it's, I don't know. It's something like it's a stomach infection, and it's life threatening. And we had a couple of scary weeks there. Um, and the way we had talked to James, we weren't going to release the book until he got the thumbs up and liked the design like the layouts and everything like that. And then we were laid up for a few weeks. You know, I'm getting all these emails. Was the book worth the book? And I'm like, guys, hang on, please. You know, you will get your book. You know, um, while there were tons of people who were super happy to help James and all, there's always a few in the, in the internet community, you know, that have that negative uh, negativity. So Don't we know. Uh, yep. Yeah. Where's my book? So there was a lot of that. And, um, Finally, James made it through, and he, he was doing pretty well. We got him a look at the book, and we rushed to get it. And I probably missed a handful of edits um, that I wish I had done. Uh, just a couple of, I would guess there's probably a handful, maybe six or seven typos in there that we missed. Um, but nobody seems to care. And they've gotten the book, and we're getting all kinds of reviews um, that this is one of the best books that they've ever read with all the different wrestlers who have contributed. I mean, we've got Jim Ross, who wrote The Office. Uh, Nick Foley wrote a, wrote a, uh, a forward as well as uh, Violent J from the ICP, uh, Chavo Guerrero, um, Jerry Jarrett wrote something, Cowboy Bill Watts wrote something, Coco Beware. Uh, we also had passages by Jim Duggan, um, Jake the Snake Roberts, Kevin Sullivan, all kinds of people. When I called them up and said, hey, can you give us a little bit for the book? We got all kinds of stuff, and they helped fill out stories and make the stories more rich. We got dialogue. Um, the book really reads more like a story in that there's a lot of correct dialogue of, you know, an exchange. So it wasn't just um, uh, Andre the Giant was backstage, and he, had, he got in a scuffle with me, you know, Kamala speaking. It, you hear what Andre said, and you hear what, what uh, James said to him, and you know who was in there and who else spoke in the locker room, um, Dick Murdoch and different people. And so uh, I think I think if uh, people give it a chance and check out KamalaSpeaks.com uh, and they're interested in the book, uh, they'll follow along with a lot of other people are saying is that's a very different book and um, reads like an actual story. I'm also an English teacher, so I've had a number of years writing and uh, teaching writing. And I think I figured out from teaching my classes what the kids like, what the wrestling fans would like to hear. It's a lot of voice, a lot of characterization and stuff. I think we, we did a good job with that. So if you're interested in the book, KamalaSpeaks.com, and I guess, Kenny, is it available on uh, Amazon as well? Yep, it's available on Amazon. On Amazon, um, you can get the traditional book. Um, if you're looking for an autographed copy, which um, pretty much the only way to get that right now because Kamala's not able 
um, due to health restrictions to do a whole lot of autograph signings. Kamala Speaks is a good place to get that. Um, and also, if you're into the idea of really helping them out, it's better to buy at Kamala Speaks because uh, KamalaSpeaks.com, uh, there's no middleman. It's, uh, there's no Amazon taking a cut. So we'll direct the listeners to KamalaSpeaks.com. Kenny Casanova, thank you very much for taking the time to speak about, to, uh, about Kamala today. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate the plugs that you guys could do us. Nice. It's oh. our pleasure, and hopefully we can talk to you down the road. Great. Thanks. And we're back. Thanks to Kenny Casanova once again. Rob, uh, before we start talking about Kamala, what is your introduction to Kamala? What's the first memory you do have of Kamala as a wrestler? Well, I talked to talk to Kenny about it in the interview. Kamala, he, he was probably, he had his biggest run probably in the mid-80s when he worked with Hogan and Andre and whatnot. But my first memories of Kamala is probably his feud with The Undertaker in 92 and the casket match at the 92 Survivor Series. And then some of the work he did afterwards. I didn't know much about Kamala because he was, I don't want to say he was before my time, but he was kind of wrapping up his WWF run at that time. And then, of course, I remember the Kamala from the Dungeon of Doom in the, in, in the mid-90s. And he was only in WCW for a brief period of time. So, yeah, the very first memory I have of Kamala was the Survivor Series casket match. What about yourself? For me, the memory of him is not him wrestling or anything like that. It is a LGN action figure from the mid-80s. Okay. That I, that I, I had two I, big tubs filled, filled with those wrestling figures. figures. And I just and played I just with played them all the ball freaking ball time. And it was great because I could just have the ring and the figures. And Kamala was my favorite deal. Yeah, he was. He played that role. And maybe I'm going to go back. I am think I'm, you know, on the WWE Network. I think I'm going to go back and watch some of his matches with Hogan and whatnot because I don't think I really – I don't want to say I didn't appreciate Kamala, but I don't think I really kind of understood the whole aura of Kamala because, again, you and I were the same age. We kind of the, – the big run that he had was kind of a little bit before we, we got into wrestling. But I really want to go back and watch and see uh, how, how he worked with guys like Hogan in main event scenes. What really surprised me, Rob, is the fact that he introduced Sting – and the Ultimate Warrior to the face paint. And that really was a shock to me. I never heard that story before. And it's really interesting to see that things in wrestling today would be a lot different if Kamala would never paint his face. Exactly. Like, would Warrior and Sting gone on to be huge superstars? We'll never know if they didn't paint their face. But Probably not, because have... that's that what make them unique. They, well, everybody yeah, was no. built up like they were back then. But because of the face paint, they were different. It was character development, right, Kevin? Yeah. It was, part, it was part of their character. And I really like hearing that uh, – the because he gets knocked a lot. And I really liked hearing that the Warrior was very, very good to Kamala. I thought, I thought that was kind of a cool way and a good way to remember the Ultimate Warrior saying, yeah, you know, a lot of people didn't like the work with the Warrior. His matches weren't great. But he, he, there was some good in the man. You know what I mean? So I thought that was cool to hear. All right. So we'll direct the listeners once again to KamalaSpeaks.com. Or if you're easier for you, go to Amazon. But uh, go to, Cam- uh, to KamalaSpeak.com and support Kamala. It helps him. It's going to give him a better quality of life. Mm-hmm. He's going to give you great stories. And that book is really worth the price. And you know what? To be honest with you, Kevin, after doing the interview, I think I'm going to go to the – I think I'm going to pick up a copy of the book as well. Mine's already on the way. Oh, awesome. And uh, until we finish reading that book and giving you some uh, – Nice quotes about it. Take a second and listen to the WrestleMania Minutes, our version of a WrestleMania countdown. Every two days until WrestleMania 31, you get five minutes of overview of the greatest show on earth. And until then, Rob, you know what? What's that, Kevin? Take that bump.